thank you so much, uh, Julia, and uh, thank you to all of you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, you're joining us from. Uh, we're delighted to have so many people um, come and, uh, and share this conversation um, with Samim uh, Hoshman today. And I have to say, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Samim to, um, to this call, uh, given the circumstances and given this was organized with short notice. Um, Samim is joining us from Tajikistan, um, and uh, we're, we're really delighted to have him. So a short introduction uh, of Samim. Um, so in May 2019, Samim was appointed Afghanistan climate change director at the National Environmental Protection Agency. And he led Afghanistan's technical negotiations um, at the UN climate talks in uh, Madrid in 2019, uh, and has advocated extensively for climate finance to reach conflict affected states, uh, particularly through um, funds like the Green Climate Fund. Um, in parallel to that work, Samim uh, is served as the head of the National Ozone Unit, um, where he played a significant role in enforcing the country's um, ban on uh, ozone depleting substances, um, which is uh, part of the Montreal Protocol, which Afghanistan ratified in 2004. Um, prior to all his work in government, Samim has worked as a consultant uh, for the Henry Boll Foundation and a technical advisor for UNEP, the UN Environment Programme. And in 2012, um, he established Environment Watch Afghanistan, which was one of the very first community-based organizations uh, focused on climate change and environmental issues in Afghanistan. So um, after all that, thank you so much to Samim for joining us in, uh, as I said, we're quite a, a difficult, very difficult uh, circumstances uh, for Afghanistan and for Samim and his family uh, as well. Um, it's been an absolute humbling experience to be able to speak to Samim last week and um, I hope we, you enjoy this conversation. So as I mentioned, um, Samim, you're currently in Tajikistan, just outside the capital Dushanbe. Can you tell us about um, how and why you had to flee and escape Afghanistan last month? Well, thank you very much, friend. Uh, let me begin by saying hello to everyone, good morning and good evening. And thank you very much, Fran, for, for giving me the opportunity to speak about a very important issue. Before I begin with the question, I would like to also say a very happy uh, International Ozone Day. Today is 16 September 2021, which is the World Ozone Day. Uh, we used to celebrate it in Afghanistan, and this day is going to celebrate in 197 countries who ratified Montreal Protocol and their amendments. So uh, once again, a very happy World Ozone Day. Yes, uh, uh, as you said, uh, I came to Tajikistan uh, once the, the Taliban started taking over of Afghanistan and major city collapsed. I feel uh, unsafe because uh, uh, in my capacity as the national ozone officer and head of national ozone unit, I had to bring lots of restriction on the import and export of ozone depleting substances and their equipments. So uh, I had to deal with a number of uh, mafia and traders who are trying to export and import illegal uh, ODs in Afghanistan. So uh, once the uh, uh, prisoner released, I, I received several threats. So I, I, I could came to Tajikistan until the situation again came um, situation gets better in Afghanistan. So I'm very happy that I saved my life and my family's life. And currently I am in Dushanbe, Tajikistan. Great. And um, you, you, so you've managed to find a refuge, I think you are staying with a relative um, in, in Tajikistan, but can you tell us a bit about your situation now where you're living? Um, you know, what, what's your daily life um, right now? And whether and, and your hopes for maybe for the near future, have you received any support to try and resettle somewhere? Are you hoping to go back to Afghanistan? Well, thank you. Um, actually, I left Afghanistan with no belonging. Like uh, um, when I came to Tajikistan, um, 
I, I, I did not have enough money to rent a house for me. So uh, I, I went to a relative house. I'm staying with, with them. Uh, yeah, life is getting uh, hard day by day because uh, the daily expenses, living in Tajikistan, my visa extension, uh, extension like all of them are, are, are really, um, how I can say, like put me in a pressure and, and we are not uh, in, in, in peace. Like, uh, unfortunately, I haven't received any direct support from any entities because my previous job was like implementing multilateral environment agreements. So I didn't work with any government directly. So the evacuation, which, which, which happened in Afghanistan, I was not in the list. Although I requested lots of agencies, which I had worked with them previously, but uh, unfortunately, still i have not received any commitments or any good news from any any of them for for a uh, temporary resettlement or any sort of support which they could provide me at this very uh, how i can say a very uh, difficult time which i'm uh, currently dealing with so you, you mentioned a visa so you can't be on a visa in in, in tajikistan but um, have you heard anything about trying to resettle um, somewhere else? What, what are your, are you hoping you'll be able to stay in Tajikistan until um, where, where you are safe at the moment? Uh, yeah, of course, uh, uh, currently the situation here uh, safe, but my biggest tension is the visa extension, which I have uh, less than a month. And after that, uh, I, I may need to register myself with the UNHCR as a refugee in Tajikistan, which I don't want to do that. And also, I'm also waiting if, if, if other colleagues and organization support me to resettle in a safer place where I could uh, provide the daily expenses, not only for me, but for my family. Of course. Um, and so, uh, as you mentioned, the your work has actually led you to flee because of um, the role you've had in, in helping to arrest and put in prison um, illegal traders of ozone depleting substances when these people were released and you received threats, you had to flee. So are you, are you, do you fear that your life's work will be undone under the Taliban regime? Uh, uh, well, yeah. although we, we laid a very good system, uh, in the ozone unit, we conducted a number of trainings and workshops for the uh, custom department and for other enforcement authorities. But uh, still, like uh, there are some urgent work, for example, the Kegeli Amendment, which the main aim was to reduce the GEG emission, like we were supposed to help climate action reduce uh, greenhouse gases through the ratification of Kegeli Amendment. And the justification that time went to cabinet. We used to present the justification to cabinet and to ratify the Kegeli Amendment and to take part on climate action from the ozone perspective. Uh, yeah, but uh, still like there are uncertainties and uh, I'm not sure, um, I mean, if they, if they still, <clears throat> the new government, the Taliban, if, if they, if they still like uh, wanted to keep the National Environmental Protection Agency as an independent entity, because uh, they have they have nominated a number of uh, take care for various uh, uh, ministries, but uh, still no one is introduced for the National Environmental Protection Agency. Like uh, if, if I if I conclude, I can say at this time that uh, there are uncertainty, and I'm not sure whether they will continue with implementing that implementing uh, the multilateral environmental agreements or not. Of course, yes, it's a, it's a period of, of uh, really great uncertainty. And um, I guess one question I had for you is, how do you view the Taliban? The West has a certain vision of what the Taliban represents, but for you personally, how do you view the Taliban? Well, uh, I might not, uh, um, I mean, um, be very clear at this moment, because as I said earlier, my visa is going to 
be expired and I might go back to Afghanistan if I had no other option to go to resettle in another, another place. But um, uh, now they, they are leaving Afghanistan and I would like to escape my personal view at this moment. Of course. So maybe a different question or a different way of putting it is, um, how do you think the international community should engage with the Taliban going forward? Yes, when it comes to international community in regards of uh, climate change and the vulnerability of Afghanistan in terms of environment, I would say that, I mean, let's put the political, political uh, issues aside. Now, what I'm believing is that uh, the community in Afghanistan, my people in Afghanistan, they are suffering. The climate change had a very negative impact in every part of society. And uh, unfortunately, the community, the people of Afghanistan, they are not aware. They didn't know that we are suffering because other countries are releasing carbon dioxide. Other countries are caused of climate change. That's why we are suffering. That's why we are facing droughts. We are facing extreme you know, wave. So I think the international community should not uh, compromise the humanitarian, the development aids and supports to the people of Afghanistan. That, 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 that's my comments at that, this situation because I, I was witnessed because <clears throat> as you said, as a director for climate change, I knew the depth of climate change impact in Afghanistan, not only natural disaster, but within the society, the human rights, the, 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 the rights of uh, women and the, 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 the age, the children in marriage and the uh, social conflict, all of them were somehow related to, uh, to, to climate change impacts in Afghanistan, but unfortunately they were not aware of it. And would, do you think that there is any kind of environmental awareness among the Taliban? Well, uh, I mean, apparently uh, it seems like uh, not very well, because uh, if it was important, they should have uh, also announced someone as a take care for the National Environmental Protection Agency. Okay, so probably clearly not, not at all a, a priority um, at this stage. Um, so this is probably um, also, what uh, uh, some of the questions that um, you have sent us uh, early want to really talk about is this issue that um, Western countries, including the US and Europe, have so far refused to um, recognize the Taliban regime. And yet there is a sense that um, at least the, the UK government has said that uh, it, it will engage without formally recognizing um, the, the Taliban. So. Um, I guess one of the, the, the questions uh, the, that I have and maybe some of you share is, how can the international community continue to support climate action in Afghanistan um, without empowering the regime or without formally recognizing the Taliban, um, the Taliban regime? Well, yeah, um, I mean, while it comes to uh, humanitarian support and developing support, the international community should find a way. Like we have UN agencies are still working in Afghanistan. There are international NGOs that are willing to work in Afghanistan. They have to find a, a mechanism to support the people of Afghanistan, the community, and to build resilience in Afghanistan through other international NGOs. So, I mean, there are ways. There are several ways that they can uh, provide support. Uh, um, it doesn't mean that uh, if they support through any channel, it will go back to Taliban. Like recognition of Taliban as a government is one issue, which is a political issue. But I mean, dealing with climate change in one of the most vulnerable country in the world is another issue. I mean, there are ways for, uh, for, for, for supporting the countries. Can you give us an example of, of ways or of things that you think um, of mechanism that could be put in place or should be put in place? 
For instance, even in previous government, most of the international funds were implementing by international implementing entities like UN agencies, international NGOs, like WCS, like even a very big fund for environment was one of the EU project, which was for adaptation and, and, and environment awareness. That project was implementing by Wildlife Conservation Society in Afghanistan. Our first project with GCA, GCF was supposed to implement by UNDP in Afghanistan. And likewise, like every like projects of uh, g global environmental facilities, we had several projects from GIF-5, from GIF-6. All of projects were implementing by one of UN agencies and, and the third party. None of them were coming directly to the government of Afghanistan. Like a very good example could be the National Ozone Unit, which I'm director for it. Like the fund for the ozone was not directly going to government. It was going to UNEP and the project was implementing through UN, UNEP. They could, they, could, they, could, they, could, they could still use the same example. Mm -hmm. uh, when, do you think the Taliban are likely to accept that? I mean, that mechanism was not even acceptable for the previous government. Mm. I, I, I wanted to uh, build the capacity to get the fund directly, to implement the funding in, in Afghanistan with, with the government in order to reduce the implementation charges. You know, while this funding coming through the international entities, there are lots of charges which is going directly to that implementing entities which is UN agencies and other NGOs, like we wanted to, to, to implement projects yeah, with a government entities, but uh, the standard which set by that mechanisms were not like, uh, we could not uh, fulfill it. Uh, I mean, it is not uh, based on request of a government. It is the internal mechanism of the climate finance mechanisms. Like every international communities, in order to in order to uh, make sure of transparency, make sure of corruptions and all these things, they they, they will have their own implementation methods. Mm -hmm. So we did speak. So the so far before the the Taliban takeover, the Green Climate Fund um, did have, as you mentioned, an active project uh, in Afghanistan. Um, it was looking at um, rolling out mini grids, uh, particularly renewables in rural areas um, for energy access. Uh, that program has now been suspended. The uh, Green Climate Fund uh, confirmed to us uh, last week um, and they are doing a review, a security review, um, and, and they're yet to take a decision about how to, what to do next. Um, I guess, I mean, what would you tell donor countries about, you know, what would you tell donor countries about why it is so important for climate aid to continue to reach Afghans? And how should the money be spent? Well, what do you think are the priorities? Um, you know, in terms of adaptation, for example, what types of projects should the money be used for? Well, uh, the Green Climate Fund, uh, the project which we had, the very first project of Afghanistan, which we uh, counted as a breaking through to the Green Climate Fund, I personally remember that uh, we had lots of discussion, lots of negotiations in COP25. And I personally attended the global uh, program conference of GCF, the private sector conference of GCF in Korea. I met with lots of colleagues uh, in, in the Green Climate Fund. So uh, successfully, we could, uh, uh, last year, we could access to the Afghanistan first. Uh, of, uh, fund from the GCF because funding in GCF, as you uh, might know, it's it's based on a competency. It is not on a specific allocation like uh, global environmental facilities, and that was a very big achievement for Afghanistan. Yeah, in terms of what is the priority for Afghanistan, once we receive that projects as a breaking through projects, we came to uh, develop a country program the priority for Afghanistan. We, uh, uh, we collected almost uh, uh, 60 projects and out of them, we shortlisted 11 
project, which is the top priority for Afghanistan. And we wanted to represent that 11 project as a country, national country program to the GCF and other climate finance mechanism as a priority for Afghanistan. That, pro that, that project was also included the projects on the agriculture, uh, fighting with natural disaster, building resilience, and so far. Can you give us a so, few, uh, maybe a few more specific examples when you say um, on agriculture, for example, and building resilience, um, what, what, what exactly um, was the project targeting? Or? Yeah, uh, uh, for agriculture, for example, the, the smart agriculture and the in and and in, in a very uh, um, uh, uh, in a very uh, how I can say uh, um, vulnerable places, we we proposed a project which we could use the uh, uh, smart irrigation to to promote smart agriculture and uh, to make people able that. Even if there is a, a threat for drought, they can still do their farming. It was a very technical project. We in the National Environmental Protection Agency, our job was to see the concept of the proposal and to talk with the, for example, the Ministry of Agriculture and see their justification. So uh, from our perspective, that was the best project for Afghanistan. And if I give you another example, the early warning system, <clears throat> because we witnessed lots of floods in Afghanistan. One of the project was early, 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 early warning system and early action. So that was the very uh, good project um, uh, from our point of view. We also proposed the second phase of our first project with the GCA, the uh, to to promote the. Uh, 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 solar uh, system in Afghanistan. Also, there were another project, the cobble transportation system. We wanted to build a clean transportation system in cobble as a pilot project. So these are the few examples of that country program which we had developed. Great. Well, thank you for sharing those. And um, I guess overall adaptation was an absolute priority and you have worked um, tirelessly for the last decade on trying to uh, build Afghanistan's resilience. Um, you were also in the months ahead of the Taliban takeover preparing for COP26. Um, you told me in our first conversation that you had written some initial documents and you were working to try and put a delegation together to go to the conference. Um, what would have been what would, what would have been your priorities in Glasgow at COP26 and do you think anybody can go to Glasgow and represent Afghanistan? Well, I think my colleagues who are still in Afghanistan are trying to convince the new government to attend COP26, which uh, I'm sure they also understand uh, the Glasgow COP is very, very important. We, we had our preparation. The uh, national determined contribution, uh, we prepared prepare the initial national determined contribution and we also we were ready to present our national determined contribution at COP26. Also uh, uh, we wanted to uh, um, somehow build a mechanism, interministerial mechanism to, to discuss with other ministries within Afghanistan to go uh, to bring them in the same picture and also to negotiate our our, our values in COPs because what we believe as a one of the most vulnerable country, we fulfilled all requirements by the UNFCCC. Like we submitted our initial national communication, second national communication. We prepared the first biannual report, BWAR one. We also prepared the inventory, GG inventory in Afghanistan for the very first time. But in return, we received nothing from the UNFCCC. Like they have introduced green climate fund but the green climate fund accessing to to, to that fund is is, is, is is quite slow and painful like um, it's very difficult for a country which is still in a state of war and a state of conflict to get access to that fund one of our issue was to ask them to make a specific allocation within that fund for a countries which is 
least developing countries, but at the same time, they are in a state of conflict, in a state of war. We cannot like compete with other uh, uh, countries. They are like, at least they are safe. They can travel to any provinces safely. They can collect data. Mm. They are still least developed countries, but there are all countries like Afghanistan. There are many other countries that they cannot travel safely. They cannot collect data safely, and they are not ready to access a competitory fund. You know, that is what we wanted to uh, put on the table our national determined contribution. And in return, we wanted to ask for, for, for a realistic support, not a promise. I think that's a, and, I think that's a, yeah. a very important point you raise, and I'm sure we will get many questions um, uh, from the audience here to, to try and uh, uh, talk further about this, because I think that's uh, probably a, a really important point. And as you say, not just for Afghanistan, but for other conflict affected states um, in the world. I guess um, you did mention something about COP26, and uh, this will be my last question before I, uh, I maybe open it up to the floor. Um, but you, you mentioned that the, you had colleagues who were trying to convince the uh, Taliban caretaker government to attend COP26. So do you think the UN, UN climate change and the UK should allow the Taliban to attend the conference if they requested to do so? Again, again, uh, Fran, like what I'm telling is like climate change is a very serious and a different issues. You know, climate change, we should not mix it with political issues. Let's see climate change as a, as a, as a disaster, which is coming to any countries despite their political views and political options. Like climate change has a threat in Afghanistan. Climate change is a big threat in Afghanistan, even with Taliban, without Taliban, with a new government, doesn't matter. Climate change will not see the political side. Climate change will not see borders. Doesn't matter for, for, for climate change, like this issue. So what I'm again trying to say, Let's see climate change as a, as, 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 a, as, a, as a something which is real, which is a disaster. And coping with climate change requires every country's, every political views, every religious uh, uh, views. Like, um, I mean, we should let them, let them represent Afghanistan because now they are in charge. Well, on that note, I think that's quite a powerful, strong message um, to end this, this first section of this conversation. And um, hopefully lots of you have uh, many questions to uh, ask Samim, who's um, made himself available for, to do this, which again, I have to say, we're extremely grateful for. Um, I think Julia will, will help uh, um, maybe monitor questions. Please keep them coming. Um, there's a a few questions already in the in the chat, which uh, some of them are, are, are really interesting. Maybe I'll just um, start by uh, reading this first one, and then um, Julia, if you want to take it from here as well. But there's a questions from from uh, Marieka uh, in the chat, and um, uh, that says, uh, are the Taliban likely to cooperate with other countries in the region in order to have more impact uh, in the UN climate negotiations? So maybe inside the kind of climate diplomacy um, sphere, could you see uh, the Taliban have any discussions on climate change uh, with uh, regional uh, neighbors and, and countries? Yeah, so far, unfortunately, I, I didn't see any discussion and um, talk about climate change issues. Even I, I saw the recent uh, Geneva conference, which was uh, specifically set for Afghanistan and the international community committed to almost more than a, a billion dollar to Afghanistan. But I didn't see anything, any commitment in terms of climate change resilience. So I think mm -hmm, not yet. Lots of other things are priority for them at this moment. OK, OK, um, so I hope that answers your um, Question, Marieke. Um, Julia, have you got some questions um, that 
we should ask Samin. Yeah, so thank you for your contributions to the chat. Um, there's people saying they completely agree with you, uh, Samim, and uh, Thomas Dowling saying he's making the same case for Myanmar, uh, presumably on the uh, you know promises for climate finance. And Monica Araya says uh, it's helpful to hear your view. And the last point was very powerful. So thank you, thank you so much, Samim. Um, uh, Jörg has asked, how relevant is Afghanistan's coal export as income source for the new government? Well, well, that's a very good question, uh, the, uh, Julia. Like, uh, even in COP25, one of our main discussion with the Secretary of UNFCCC was that that time the president of Afghanistan was saying that if we have not received any support from the UNFCCC and their financial mechanism, we have coal to burn and provide electricity to run our factories and even to export and export, uh, import. Like there is still a chance. We have coal in Afghanistan. And if we have not received support from the UNFCCC, that might be possible, and that's possible. That's realistic. So, so you, you, you are saying that, uh, that there is a, either the international community does support Afghanistan, even under Taliban rule, or coal will continue to be used and exported um, under the Taliban regime. Yes, that's true. If, if, if they have not received any support, and they, if there were any, they, if, if there was not any, a specific uh, climate change diplomacy. Like now I'm expecting that for me personally, it is very difficult to reach out to them and tell them the importance of climate change. But the, but, but the people like, for example, the US, they, they appointed a special on, uh, envoy for, for climate change. Uh, so these people who are in a top position while they are meeting the, the Taliban, they can discuss this issue with them, you know? They have to tell them that, look, there are uh, UNFCCC and you, you shouldn't export and import, uh, import coal and return, we are ready to provide this kind of support to your government. You know, these are all negotiable. Mm. Again, I think some, some powerful, um... Some powerful comments here. Um, I, I, there's, there's a, a question uh, related in the chat, and and please do raise your hands as well if you want to come in and, and address uh, Samim directly. Uh, you know, you're more than welcome to do that. But there's a question from Fawa Durani um, who asks, um, I think the Taliban lack major technical expertise in terms of environment protection, um, and so how could they fill this gap? How could the international community or national experts support them uh, to address climate issues and environmental issues? Sorry, can you repeat the question? So, I think I didn't yes. get it. So the question is, the Taliban, um, the assumption is that the Taliban lack the technical expertise to deal with climate issues. They don't, they are not maybe aware of how, um, uh, the UNFCCC functions, or maybe they, are, they, they just don't have the um, uh, technical knowledge and maybe more general knowledge uh, about climate and environmental issues. So the question is, how could the international community and maybe experts around the world support Afghanistan in plugging that gap? Yes, well, as I said previously, like the international community, first of all, should uh, through the attention of Taliban on environmental issues, specifically on climate change. Uh, I'm sure once the situation is normal and people feel safe to go back and support, they can, uh, they can go back and support. Like there are still experts who are in Afghanistan. They can fill the gap, I'm sure. If they have the support of international community, like not financial support, they can also send advisors. They can send technical experts to, to help uh, the, the uh, the, the, the Taliban government to cope with uh, environmental challenges. I mean, the, there is a need. Now, I mean, what, when we see climate change as a global issue, like, so Taliban, priority for them are, are other issues. 
Like if Afghan cannot reach out to them and telling them the importance of this uh, climate change, at least the international community can, can tell them, they can easily uh, communicate with them. Mm -hmm. and, and you personally, Samim, if, if you were called upon to go back and, uh, and, and, help, and help provide that expertise, would you? Well, if the situation gets normal and if I feel safe under them, I would go for, for my people because I know the depth of uh, uh, this uh, disaster. And I, I think somehow the, 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 the women, the, the, the demands, the children, they have rights on, on me as an expert because, uh, because I have studied in Afghanistan, I grew up in Afghanistan, and I'm feeling responsible for them. Um, great. There are a couple more new questions in. Shall I read them out, Chloe? Yes, go for it. Jim. Yeah. So Lena Yassin uh, has asked, uh, would you say the, the environmental NGOs and activists in Afghanistan could be putting themselves in danger by continuing to engage in climate activism and projects? Will the Taliban allow climate activism to exist? Well, I don't think so that there will be a danger for the environmental activists because uh, when, when there is a disaster in terms of environment, they, they will equally treat everyone. For example, let me give you an example. If they, the weather gets polluted, the Kabul city gets polluted in winter, no one is safe. So, uh, I think there is a chance for international NGO to go to Afghanistan and, 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 and start working. I mean, sooner or later, the government of Taliban will see the challenges, the, the environmental challenges, the climate change challenges. If it is 10 years back, it was not clear, but currently we are seeing the negative impact of climate change in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and, and maybe Lina was also asking, um, what about Afghan climate activists? What about the, the, the existing um, network of civil society groups in Afghanistan? Do you think, are they at risk? Are they in danger? I don't think any uh, direct danger from them because uh, w when you work for the environment, I, I, um, it is okay. Like, Mine was a specific uh, issue because my job was to deal with the traders and mafia. That's why I'm feeling unsafe now because I, I received threats from them. But for other environmentalists and environmental activists, there should be space for them in Afghanistan to continue raising awareness. They are doing nothing wrong. They are, they, they are planting trees. They are uh, raising their voice for clean air. They are trying to uh, tell the international community to support us, to deal with climate change impacts. And I don't see any, any major issue in this regard. Okay, okay. Well, maybe that's a, a slight uh, glimpse of hope uh, to hang on to there. Um, there is a, another question about someone, um, uh, Jay Shri, who's asking, um, that Kabul is probably one of the most polluted cities uh, in the world based on some uh, Swiss IQ air app uh, observations. Um, so Samim, they want to ask you, what do you think could be the reason for Kabul's high level of air pollution? Well, uh, the, uh, the, the, the air pollution was a major issue last year. Kabul was among the top polluted area. And the reason was because uh, the, 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 the rays of pollution in the Kabul city and also the, uh, the, the, the quality of the fuel in the cars, the, the number of cars, the un, uh, asphalt uh, streets and cities, the, un, the building of unplanned building of uh, 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 tall building in Kabul and also the burning the cool the, for, for heating system. Uh, um, yeah, that was the major uh, uh, major cause for, 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 for air pollution during winter. The, uh, the, the main part is the geographical location of Kabul 
thermal inversion, which is a technical um, uh, phenomena. It is uh, it's happening in coal during winter. Okay, but, but coal coal is a, is one of the main uh, use um, uh, uh, sources of fuel for for families uh, for, for for people living in Afghanistan as well. So coal is burnt domestically, um, not just exported, of course. Yes, we have we have in, in, in Afghanistan coal, and they are using it to make their house warm, like indiv individual families, buildings, cities. They are using coal for uh, for for to 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 warm up, to to keep themselves warm during winter. Okay, well, thanks for, thanks for everybody um, for your questions so far. Please keep them coming. We have a bit more time. We have about 15 minutes um, left on this call. And again, if you want to address me directly, just raise your hand and I'm sure you, uh, Julia can um, unmute you and, and allow you to, to speak. Um, there's a question uh, here from uh, Doug Ware, who's saying, um, who's saying thank you, Samim, uh, for, for, for talking to us today. And he's saying, uh, you touched on how international organizations have supported environmental governance and the implementations of MEAs in Afghanistan. I'm not quite sure what MEAs is in this context. Maybe Doug, maybe you know Samim, or maybe Doc can can clarify. Um, but he's saying, um, what is the most imp based on your experience? What is the most important change that would be made in how the international community supports environmental governance in conflict affected states? So what can be the, the most important change to uh, support environmental governance in conflict affected states by the international community? Yeah, well, the, now as, as, as we see in the past months, like lots of uh, embassies are closed, lots of international NGOs are closed, like previously for getting a fund, we, uh, we, want, we somehow uh, like, let me give you a personal example. For getting the uh, GCF or other uh, climate uh, finance for, from a mechanism, we also uh, wanted to lobby with their uh, embassies. Like we had several embassies in Kabul and we personally, you know, as a team, like that time I was director for climate change, we, we were going to them and we were discussing to them that so these are our projects, support us or we want this kind of support now as embassies are closed it's a quite difficult for the new government to to gain funding to receive funding from the international community but there are ways there are still ways uh, the taliban government first of all they should understand the urgency of climate change then they have to engage with them to to support building resilience and to promote um, um, resilience in, in Afghanistan. But do you think the international community needs to have a, a broader conversation around how to uh, support environmental governance in conflict affected states in general? I mean, is that, has the international yeah. community overlooked this issue maybe um, in recent years? In COP25, when we raised that issue, like we got lots of support from other countries who, who have similar situation. Like they cannot, I mean, there are some sort of practical ways that international community can support countries like Afghanistan or countries that still least developed countries in a state of war. For instance, like in Green Climate Fund, there are a chair for, uh, for, for, for LDC countries, for developing countries, one of our main suggestion that time was to give one chair for, for, for the countries who are a state of war. Mm -hmm. They can better uh, somehow defend and somehow um, convince the board member to get funding. Like there are several ways. I mean, the, the international community should show flexibilities because they are going for the majority. Like even within the LDC group, the majority of countries, they are in a good state. Only few countries have the similar situation like Afghanistan. That is why our voice is not loud. 
That's why no one will listen to us. Mm-hmm. You know, while we are trying to, to raise an issue, they are saying that, okay, good, it's a good point, go to your group and raise that issue. When you go to your group, which is LDC, there are lots of other sh- issues which is important for LDC rather than a few ca- small countries uh, find. These are uh, very difficult points even within the call. Mm. But I think one, one point uh, to note um, is that the idea, that proposition um, that Samin just mentioned about having on the board of the GCF a representative that could speak on behalf of conflict affected states and make sure maybe that um, their needs and point of view are, are fully reflected within that uh, discussion and maybe facilitate access to, to funding as well. Um, great, the plenty of really great and interesting questions. Um, please uh, do continue to writing them in the chat or, um, or raise your hand if anybody wants to add something to this conversation. We did have some questions that came in be- previously. Uh, I feel as though we have covered some of them, um, but there are, I think there are a couple that uh, perhaps I could ask now. Um, so there are a couple around agriculture, Samin. So Samuel asked, is there a constituency within Afghanistan for regenerative agriculture? We, 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 I mean, in the Ministry of Agriculture, I'm sure there were some initiatives on that, but because uh, it was not directly my field, I cannot comment on, on it right now. I need to check. Fair enough. Um, there, uh, I think the others we've covered uh, about environmental activists. Oh, and there was one about um, Afghanistan's neighbors. So Francis asked, uh, said, uh, Afghanistan surrounded by high carbon emitting neighbors like China, Russia, and Pakistan, to name a few. What should uh, the Taliban government do in order to call its neighbors to cut down those emissions and minimize the effects of climate change on Afghan citizens? Well, I think uh, asking neighboring country to reduce their carbon dioxide carbon dioxide emission is not the direct responsibility of Afghanistan because if they, if they increase their carbon dioxide emission, they will not directly affect in Afghanistan. They will affect global environment. They will affect the Earth, planet Earth. That's why we have the UNFCCC. That's why we have the COP. So uh, yeah, Afghanistan could say generally, that reduce GG emission because we are the most vulnerable. You are producing carbon dioxide, we are paying back. We are vulnerable. That's our position. But directly, uh, I mean, one government cannot uh, ask other government to reduce their emission. They can raise their voice, uh, voices in, in, in the COP. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that in COP26, uh, which is in Glasgow, uh, most of the countries, they have prepared their uh, uh, um, national determined contribution and they will, uh, they will present their NDC and of course in returns, they, they want some, some support. Absolutely, thank you for that, Samim. Um, so um, I think we've gone around most of our questions um, we have a few more minutes um, with, with Samim today. So if you've got a question, um, this is the time. Um, please raise your hand or drop it in the chat, um, whatever's um, easiest for you. I'll just flag that uh, Doug Ware has shared uh, a blog in the chat about how, um, how conflict and war contribute to, um, to emissions. If anybody's interested in that, um, he has shared a link. Um, but if there is no more questions, oh, yes, there is a question. One just came in. <laughs> um, thanks, Anne. So we've got a question, uh, a question from Anne, um, who, who says, um, 
uh, do, do you know, are you aware, Samim, of uh, how many environmental uh, experts were able to evacuate Afghanistan uh, last month? And, um, and does the technical capacity for climate action still exist in the country, which I think partly answered that there are still some technical experts in the country? Um, but maybe you have some thoughts on that. Do you think, um, you know, how many? What do you, have you uh, have you got an idea of the proportion of people, uh, your colleagues that were a, that were able to evacuate the country, um, or are they still in Afghanistan? Um, uh, and and is there action that can be taken uh, by by people like you who are uh, outside of Afghanistan? Uh, what what can what can they do to help uh, to help Afghans today? Well, yeah, I don't have the exact number of that, how many people like uh, are uh, evacuated from Afghanistan. But uh, what I understand is that there are still people who knows the, the urgency of climate change and they're ready to, 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 to participate in COP21 and they're ready to somehow convince the government on importance of environment. Even the previous government, they were not fully aware of environmental issues. Like it is the duty of experts to let the government know and take their attention on environmental issues. But uh, in the last question, I, I didn't get it clearly, but uh, if the situation gets better, if the environmentalists and experts and other part of society feels themselves uh, safe back, I mean, if they want, they, they could go back and, 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 and still like uh, um, lobby for the environmental issues. Of course, yeah. But I guess we're it's it's a bit unclear how many people are still in the country who's managed to get out. Not everybody's managed to connect with each other yet. So maybe that maybe that picture will get a bit clearer in the coming months. Yes, yes, yes. It's too early, like because. No one knows who's where. No one knows who's where. But I mean, like the one part of the question was like me as a climate expert, I can say, or a climate or environment advocate, or like I, I, I'm trying to somehow reach out to everyone and to tell them the urgency and also to let them know the situation of Afghanistan in terms of climate change. Thanks. Thanks, Samim. Uh, Louise has raised her hand. Would you like to uh, speak? Um, thanks very much, Samim, for answering our question so far. Um, I work for a charity that looks at helping people in the UK lobby their um, MPs on climate issues. So they're trying to help improve the government's action on climate change. Um, what would you ask from us to ask our governments to do in the run-up to COP26 um, to help represent the Tal um, Afghanistan and Afghanistan's people. Louis, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, for, uh, for for the um, your purpose. Like the most important thing is that at least they should support someone. I'm also ready to attend COP. If I'm not representing directly my country, but still I will be there to, to be witness and also to, to talk generally about the uh, uh, countries where, where they, are, uh, they are still in conflict. Like I could raise my voice and also uh, they, can, they can support some national uh, uh, civil society based organization in Afghanistan to, uh, who are still in Afghanistan to, to somehow raise this issue, to, to, to talk about this issue. I mean, to conduct an activity to get the attention of new government on climate change issues. I mean, that, that, that's my two specific uh, um, purpose for, for you to ask your colleague to do. I think that's quite a clear, Clear response um, that the that climate change doesn't recognise a political system. Uh, that if the Taliban are in charge in Afghanistan, um, the the world will have to will have to engage with them and and, and give them a seat um, at the climate 
negotiation table. Um, that's a powerful message, uh, Samim. If there is no last minute question, uh, we might wrap it up there. Um, so uh, this is your, your last chance. Uh, but if not, thank you so much, Samim, uh, for, for giving us and providing us with this insight and your perspective. As I say, we're absolutely privileged to have you with us today. And, um, and given your personal uh, situation right now as well, we're, we're extremely grateful that you could join us. So thank you so much. Um, do, do stay in touch and, um, and thank you everybody for, for having joined us today. Thank you everyone. And thank you, Samim. Lots of thank you messages coming in through the chat. So we're very grateful to have you here today. Thank you. All right. Goodbye everybody.